Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Nice to see you, nice to hear you. Uh, today we will listen to a lecture, uh, The Cognitive Paradigm of, in the Artificial Intelligence Research by Dr. Antonio Leto from University of Turin. Uh, today we look forward to learning more about uh, understanding of nature of intelligence, cognitive technologies to replace humans, and perspectives of using these technologies in economics and management. In the future, uh, you could join the cutting edge of uh, scientific researchers at the University of Turin with Dr. Lieto. And dear colleagues, welcome Dr. Antonio Lieto. Okay, so, uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your very kind invitation. Uh, I would have preferred to, to come to Kiev for giving this lecture, but uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, it was not uh, uh, possible, but uh, here we are. So um, the goal of this uh, lecture is that one of providing a sort of uh, um, general overview of the main insights coming from the so-called cognitive paradigm within uh, the artificial intelligence, uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, research um, agenda. So the main driving questions uh, of the talk will be the following one. So what characterize a cognitively inspired AI system? What are notable examples of cognitively inspired AI systems? And how this class of, of system differ from uh, um, the, the standard, let's say, AI, modern AI technologies? And how uh, can cognitively inspired AI systems be used? So what's their purpose in life? So uh, a first uh, characterization of uh, uh, such class of machines can be represented in the, in the, the following way. So uh, cognitive artificial systems are uh, um, um, basically uh, systems, uh, uh, machines that have been designed and implemented by taking inspiration, uh, uh, um, taking as a source of inspiration, a natural system. It can be a human, but can be also other biological systems, such as, for example, animals. animals. And the kind of inspiration is usually uh, grounded, rooted in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the kind of heuristics that, that the natural system use in order to solve the task that we also want to solve with the uh, artificial uh, uh, system. Uh, why there is this kind of approach? Well, because humans and other biological systems are still by far um, the best system able to solve a wide range of problems that machines are still not able to, uh, to solve. So this is basically the underlying motivation of this kind of uh, uh, paradigm. Uh, but this is only the first part of the story. The second part of the story is that with this kind of system, we also want to provide a sort of uh, uh, reverse inference. So we want to use this kind of system uh, uh, in order to uh, provide additional knowledge to the theoretical and experimental models explaining the behavior of a, a natural system and that uh, we have also uh, basically included, uh, we have also, also used to design artificial, uh, artificial systems. So there is this uh, loop, if you see uh, in the picture. On one end, there is this uh, inspiration side where the goal is that one of building uh, AI systems that uh, basically are able to achieve better performances, better results when compared to other AI systems. And on the other end, there is also this additional, let's say, uh, um, desideratum, which consists in uh, providing a sort of uh, um, uh, explanation back to, uh, to uh, the, um, the theory characterizing uh, basically the, um, uh, the, to the theories and the models characterizing uh, what we know about, about the natural uh, system taken as a source of inspiration. Now, from a, a historical point of view, it's important to uh, notice that uh, this kind of, let's say, loop, this kind of circular approach was not really new because it, uh, it comes from the methodological apparatus uh, uh, coming from the uh, cybernetics, okay? And in the first days of artificial intelligence uh, uh, research, 
uh, so starting from the 50s of the last century until the mid 80s of the last century basically uh, um, most of the uh, system most of the frameworks that uh, were developed were either uh, cognitively inspired or biologically inspired so and this is true for example both for uh, for example for the general problem solver uh, system uh, by newell and simon from uh, for the um, minsky proposal of the uh, frames in order to uh, in, in the field of knowledge representation uh, for uh, for uh, the um, proposal by uh, shank about the conceptual dependency theory and the scripts as a narrative structure for natural language uh, and story understanding, but also for the so-called parallel distributing processing uh, paradigm uh, by McClelland and uh, Ramelar. So uh, this was, I would say, the mainstream research uh, in uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, from, the, um, from its beginning until the uh, mid-80s of the last centuries. From this point on, there was a sort of uh, uh, paradigm shift in the uh, research agenda of the um, uh, of the AI, because uh, um, uh, basically uh, most of these early AI system over promised and uh, under delivered. Because also because their goal was that one of trying to understand uh, intelligence in both natural and artificial system. And this, of course, is a, a very demanding. Uh, um, scientific, uh, uh, very difficult scientific goal. So what happened is that uh, starting from the 80s, uh, there was a, a, a sort of, of shift from uh, um, considering only cognitively inspired or biologically inspired uh, intelligent uh, system to use a, a different class of heuristics, more machine oriented, uh, in order to solve very um, specific and uh, uh, narrow uh, and I would say also commercializable uh, uh, task. So uh, in this sense uh, the uh, study of AI uh, started to become uh, um, a little more uh, specialized with respect to uh, the, uh, the previous uh, um, early, uh, early days. And this uh, had uh, some advantages because nowadays we have uh, many systems that have been uh, uh, developed and that uh, have also uh, provided, uh, have, also show, have also shown, let's say, superhuman performances, but in very specialized and narrow uh, task. Uh, now, in the last decade, I would say that there is a renewed attention to uh, the field of cognitively inspired and biologically inspired system because I will use the word by Aaron Zoloman here, the gap between a natural and artificial system is still enormous and this is true both for multitasking task but also for let's say particular class of specialized problem uh, specialized problems and that i will try to uh, show you um, very briefly uh, later so uh, this is more or less a kind of historical overview the two uh, main uh, paradigm that have been uh, somehow uh, developed in this kind of uh, um, AI research framework are the so-called cognitivist uh, paradigm and the emergentist or novel AI uh, paradigm. Now they have a different focus and they also use, let's say, different means in order to model uh, intelligence in uh, artificial uh, in artificial system. In the cognitivist per perspective, the uh, focus is mainly on high-level cognitive functions, such as, for example. Um, uh, reasoning, uh, uh, natural language understanding, uh, or uh, planning, this kind of stuff. While in the new LAI perspective, uh, um, or in the emergentist perspective, the focus is mainly on perceptual tasks. In the cognitivist uh, uh, tradition, uh, the, the way in which the um, computational algorithm uh, were uh, designed took um, the so-called heuristic-driven approach. So this means that the idea was that one of trying, trying to individuate which class of heuristics the humans or other animals use in order to solve a particular task and try to replicate to implement this kind of heuristics also in uh, um, in a, uh, an artificial system while in the new lai approach the uh, focus is mainly uh, not on high level heuristics but on uh, let's say bottom up um, bottom up uh, 
uh, heuristics which are uh, mainly related, let's say, to the brain than to uh, the, uh, the mind. Again, another difference is uh, uh, another difference concern uh, the um, different uh, um, perspective with respect to the generality issues. So, in the contrast tradition, uh, there is this architectural perspective. So, the idea is that one of trying to integrate in an artificial system all the different kind of cognitive functions uh, that, for example, we humans or other animals are able to um, ex exhibit in, a, in a, a unique architecture, okay, in a sort of unifying uh, general architecture. While in the novel AI perspective, uh, um, usually uh, there is a system perspective, so it is not necessary to consider a whole architectural perspe perspective. And finally, I mean, one of the main well-known differences, as I mentioned, concern the uh, kinds of uh, uh, modeling approaches that have been developed. So, cognitivism, uh, cognitivist AI uh, is rooted in the uh, physical symbol system hypothesis by Newell and Simon and assume that there are structured representations, while uh, the Newell AI is uh, assume somehow uh, unstructured representation of the words. And for example, one of the main modeling paradigm are the um, artificial neural networks, but there are other emergentist, uh, let's say, uh, formalism that are developed, for example, that one of the dynamical system and so on and so forth. But mainly, I mean, this is the main difference. Of course, I mean, this is part of the story because then there is also a lot of hybridization between this, um, uh, these two uh, main uh, perspectives and between uh, the paradigms uh, that are used in this kind of uh, um, modeling approaches. But ju just a few words, uh, uh, mainly for the students, of course, uh, for um, pointed, pointing out the main difference between the representational perspective of cognitive and the novel AI uh, approach. So uh, um, about uh, the um, um, symbolic representations, but basically the cognitivism, as I mentioned, uh, um, assumed this motto that uh, is written in, in the slide, that is cognition is computation. So, uh, and uh, by, uh, with this motto, the cognitivist uh, um, uh, meant something like um, something uh, uh, strongly related to the uh, use of symbolic representation. So in this kind of symbolic representation, basically there are uh, nodes, uh, uh, there are um, conceptual structures which are represented as a graph with the, where we have nodes in this graph and we have a connection uh, between these nodes which are basically um, uh, logical uh, uh, predicates. And in this paradigm, intelligence is seen as uh, the capability of manipulate these symbols, okay? So, and, and these networks of symbols that go uh, together. And as I mentioned, this is of course a, a kind of high level uh, modeling uh, approach. And this different from, uh, for example, the connectionist approach, which uses, for example, artificial uh, neural networks, which nowadays are also very popular due to the success of the deep learning. Uh, well, in this kind of uh, uh, representational approaches, the idea is that one of trying to emulate the parallel processes on, uh, uh, of the brain and the neural organization of the brain. So actually, in this case, the uh, hidden nodes, the, the nodes basically representing uh, this network, are, uh, do not uh, uh, really have a, a, a semantics, while in the symbolic representation they had a, a semantics, but in this case the meaning is somehow uh, um, distributed along a pattern of uh, uh, um, networked um, artificial uh, neurons. And as I mentioned, this kind of formalism, this kind of uh, paradigms, uh, are very uh, useful in, uh, um, for perceptual tasks, so for learning, categorization, and so on and so forth. And they focus at a different level of abstraction with respect to the symbolic, uh, um, with respect to the symbolic uh, uh, approaches. Uh, and uh, m if we look at uh, the most successful modern AI system, well, we actually uh, see uh, that they derive from this kind of uh, uh, traditions. 
okay? Because, for example, the IBM Watson uh, system, that is the uh, system developed uh, by uh, IBM uh, and that uh, uh, beat the humans uh, in uh, the um, question answering game known as uh, uh, Jeopardy. Uh, basically, this is a symbolic system, okay? Even if the class of symbolic, uh, symbolic representation that it uh, uses are uh, a, more, a little bit more complicated. They are based on probabilistic uh, thematic networks and, and so on and so forth. But it is still a symbolic system. While if we go uh, and see uh, what are the underlying formalism of the uh, AlphaGo system developed by DeepMind, DeepMind uh, well, we see that uh, the, it is actually uh, um, based on a sort of new generation artificial neural network uh, uh, with, with some reinforcement learning also um, algorithm, but it is still, let's say, a connectionist, uh, uh, a very, um, let's say, advanced type of connectionist uh, uh, system. So this is to say that these two traditions have, have, uh, um, uh, have had a, a very strong impact in the history of artificial intelligence uh, uh, research and not only in the history of the cognitively inspired artificial intelligence. Uh, now, uh, mm, if we uh, come back a little bit to our main perspective, so what characterizes a cognitively inspired AI system? Well, we could say that actually both the cognitivist approach and the cognitivist modeling approach and the no AI approach, the emergentist approach, can in principle be used to design and uh, implement con a cognitive artificial system, an artificial model of cognition. Remember that in order to define something that uh, uh, something as a, a cognitive artificial system, we have to keep in mind the reverse inference, the explanatory power that this system, that the simulation of this system should have with respect to the natural system taken as a source of inspiration. So the question here uh, is, when a biologically or a cognitive inspired um, system have an explanatory power with respect to the natural system taken as a source of inspiration, and what are the requirements that we have to consider in order to design uh, an artificial system having this kind of explanatory uh, role? Uh, in order to uh, answer to these two uh, questions, it is important to introduce the distinction between functionalist versus structuralist uh, models, which are actually also two different kinds of design uh, approaches to the science of the artificial. Well, uh, uh, functionalism is uh, uh, basically um, in, was introduced by um, Hilary Patman uh, and postulates that it is somehow sufficient to have a, a weak equivalence between the um, uh, cognitive processes in the natural system that we want to uh, replicate in the artificial uh, uh, one and the uh, artificial, uh, the AI procedures that we are going to implement in, the, in, in such artificial uh, system. So what is important for the functionalism is that the, um, a, the AI procedures uh, function as, so this is um, why uh, this approach is called functionalism, function as the corresponding human uh, pro procedures. So there is a, a sort of uh, equivalence postulated at the level of the functional macroscopic properties of uh, a given uh, intelligent behavior that is based on the analysis of the same input output modification. So basically, uh, in this case, uh, um, it, it is possible to uh, um, produce a sort of predictive uh, uh, models uh, by having only this kind of weak equivalence between the, let's say, cognitive process that we want to implement in an artificial system and the corresponding uh, AI um, procedures. And I, I have uh, some example uh, later that uh, um, should, um, should help to uh, clarify this, uh, this aspect. Another important issue is that uh, it uh, uh, assumes uh, the so-called multiple realizability hypo uh, hypothesis, according to which uh, different quantity functions can be implemented, of course, in different ways. So uh, this was the, the first, let's say, uh, design paradigm, the first uh, um, uh, approach that was uh, um, uh, developed. 
but this approach uh, uh, has uh, also some problems because uh, if the equivalence between uh, the uh, cognitive procedures that you want to reproduce in an artificial system and the uh, artificial the corresponding uh, uh, ai procedures of, of such artificial artificial system are so weak then it is not possible to interpret the results of such a, a system for example how do we interpret the system uh, failures and another problem is that uh, a pure functionalist model where there is the equivalence only at this level of input output okay is uh, work as a sort of uh, uh, predictive model but it is a sort of black box because it is not really possible to individuate which are the real mechanisms that uh, uh, produce the, the same output in the natural and in the artificial system. So a very famous example is the following one. Uh, if we, uh, in, in the following one that is um, also mentioned in the Russell and Norvig uh, artificial intelligence uh, book. So if we consider birds and jets, okay. Uh, now, both these elements can fly, but of course, jets are not a good explanatory model of birds, right? Because uh, it is true that their output uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, the same, but the flying mechanisms are completely different. The only uh, things that they have in common is that they have to obey to the aerodynamics uh, law. So in this sense, uh, jets are functional systems, okay, with respect to, let's say, the, uh, the birds that were the original uh, uh, natural system taken as a uh, source of inspiration, uh, of inspiration. So they do not have any kind of explanatory role with respect to how birds uh, fly, of course. Uh, and this is, a, a, I mean, a building a functional system is, uh, uh, let's say, very important from a, an engineering uh, uh, point, uh, uh, point of view, because uh, um, as uh, we have seen, uh, this allowed us to build uh, jets. But for example, if we take a look at the uh, AI literature, uh, we could say that also the modern AI uh, system, the modern successful AI system are functional system, okay? So they are very good artificial system in very specialized tasks, question answering for IBM Watson and the game of Go for Google DeepMind. But this system do not have any kind of explanatory role with respect to the way in which human uh, um, basically uh, organize and retrieve the information when they have to, um, to um, do a question answering task or similarly um, do not have any kind of uh, explanatory role with respect to how humans play to the game uh, of Go. So in this sense, these systems are not cognitive, okay? Despite the IBM claims uh, about the cognitive computing as something like this, there is nothing uh, about uh, cognitive computing uh, here. So it's just uh, um, uh, marketing because there is no explanatory power of this system with respect uh, to the way in which we solve the same class of uh, uh, problems. And uh, for example, if we plot these two systems on a 2D axis, when on the uh, X, uh, axis we have the type of inspiration, which can be uh, computational or natural, let's say, and the kind of, uh, uh, the level of abstraction in modeling, which is considered, we can say that both these systems uh, are actually functional uh, system that uh, uh, only uh, are differ differentiated by the kind of modeling approaches that uh, they uh, uh, implement. Um, another important uh, thing that I want to point out is that this class of functional uh, system can produce very strange errors. Okay, so errors that we as humans uh, uh, um, that for us would, would, would have been sort of impossible to, uh, to do. And I have a couple examples. Uh, so one example comes from the uh, IBM Watson, and I will try, I'm going to uh, show you what is happening here. So, so this is the, uh, taken from the Jeopardy uh, game. And here there is the Watson system 
that uh, compete with two uh, humans. The topic of the question is uh, US cities. And the question is, which is the uh, US cities where, uh, where, uh, where the, its largest airport is named for a World War II hero and its second largest airport for a World War II battle? Okay, so this is the question. And the topic of the question, which is known to the contendants, is US cities. So, now, the first human provides the answer Chicago. There is only one question mark, so he's pretty sure that the answer is that one. Then there is uh, the second uh, human contender that says also, okay, Chicago is also pretty sure of this answer. Then there is the super intelligence machine, Watson, that says Toronto, okay? So, uh, I mean, uh, this is a, um, so this is a, a kind of very strange errors, right? Because uh, um, if we look at the, the way in which humans, uh, uh, given the topic, provide the answer, they seem to be quite pretty sure that uh, uh, of the, their answer. So this is uh, actually a kind of, uh, easy uh, question for them but this is the kind of question that uh, uh, um, resulted to be uh, complicated for the probabilistic uh, um, programs used by uh, by uh, Watson so this is a, still a very non-human error and another kind of non-human error uh, in this case coming from the connectionist approaches which are based on the basically underlying formalism that are uh, also used in the AlphaGo system is that, for example, it is uh, uh, very uh, easy to fool this kind of uh, uh, artificial uh, uh, neural networks. So uh, there are very sim uh, very um, there are some papers that show how these kind of networks are subject to a single p uh, pixel change when uh, um, uh, provided with adversarial attacks. So, for example one single pixel change between these two images can provide completely different categorization results. And this is also true, for example, for the pairs of pictures that you can see here on the bottom. So this is our very strange, uh, uh, very strange errors. And in general, uh, I would say that uh, in, uh, when we uh, uh, look at uh, cognitively inspired AI system, we are not uh, happy with the uh, system which, which are just uh, functional, okay? Where uh, uh, just the only thing that you are going to compare is uh, the, the input output uh, specification. What we want to build in order to have artificial uh, uh, cognitive systems or artificial models of cognition are systems uh, that, uh, that uh, have, uh, uh, are more constrained to um, uh, basically to the theoretical tenets coming from the natural system that is taken as a source of inspiration. And uh, uh, the, um, the approach that uh, uh, we, we follow in this kind of uh, um, modeling tradition is the called uh, is the so-called structuralist approach. So where we assume that there is a, it is important to have a strong equivalence between the cognitive process of the natural system that you want to implement and the corresponding algorithmic, algorithmic implementations of such uh, uh, process processes. So the focus here is not only on the functional, uh, on the equivalence of the functional organization of the processes, but also on the human likeness, on the uh, human uh, biological or psychological plausibility of the uh, processes that you are going uh, of the um, processes that you are going to implement in AI. Uh, algorithm. Of course, I mean, here you can see that is I've uh, included both biological and psychological plausibility because, as I mentioned, this depends from uh, what is uh, the kind of modeling paradigm that you use. Okay, if you use symb a symbolic approach, you are going uh, uh, to model uh, psychological uh, heuristics. If you use a more neural inspired approach, you are going um, to uh, use more biological inspired uh, um, constraints. Uh, so, um, what can be a possible problem for the structuralism? 
Well, uh, the problem is, uh, uh, can be summarized by the so-called Wiener paradox, okay? So uh, the paradox is the following one. So if we, uh, um, and now we'll use its own word. So Wiener says that, uh, well, the best material model of a cat is another or possibly the same cat, okay? So this means actually that if you want to really build a complete structural model, we are going to uh, build, uh, we should build a sort of uh, human replica or a sort of, uh, let's say, corresponding biological replica of a biological uh, organism. And this is, of course, not possible, okay? It is not possible. Uh, um, uh, so what we need in the computer, in uh, um, con cognitively, cognitively inspired artificial system are really uh, systems and models which are a good approximation with respect to um, the network system that is taken as a source uh, of inspiration. So another way to um, um, put this paradox is uh, uh, by using the word by Zenon Filichin that says, well, if we do not formulate any restriction about the model, we obtain the functionalism, okay, functionalism in the previous sense, of a Turing machine. But if we apply all the possible restriction, then we reproduce a, a, a bull human being, so a sort of a, a computational replica of a, a human being. But of course, as I mentioned, this is not possible. And an important thing to point out is that uh, also for complete simulations or complete models, and we have something like that for very, let's say, simple organism, it is actually uh, uh, impossible to uh, provide a full understanding, a full explanatory understanding uh, for the testing of a biological hypothesis. So even if the case of complete replica or very uh, simple uh, uh, organism, it is not really possible uh, to uh, have a, a complete, uh, let's say, a reverse inference uh, um, uh, uh, towards the, the natural system taken uh, as a source of inspiration. And that's why, for example, projects like the human brain projects uh, have failed because their assumption was that, uh, well, uh, you, uh, if you're going to build a sort of uh, a replica of the particular parts of the human brain, we are going to explain how the brain works, but actually uh, there is uh, something more than that, okay? So we need to build good uh, proxy models. It is not uh, useful to have uh, complete uh, um, replicas in order to uh, have, uh, um, let's say, the explanatory power, uh, to, um, to have an explanatory power uh, with respect to the natural system taken as a source of uh, inspiration. Uh, so uh, this means that uh, what we uh, really look at is uh, a sort of descriptive level to which the kind of constraints that we use that can be uh, um, psychological constraints or neural constraints allows us to uh, carry out a sort of uh, human-like uh, computation. So, uh, what I, uh, so what is really needed is a kind, a kind of coupling between a cognitive function that we want to reproduce in an artificial system and the, the kind of structure constraints that we uh, take into account in order to uh, have this kind of reverse um, reverse uh, inference. And what I want to say is that uh, we can really see the cognition, so intending as both as, um, let's say, um, um, cognitive heuristic at the cognitive level and at the biological level, we can really see the cognition as an element that provides some design constraint in the, in the uh, realization of artificial uh, um, artificial models uh, uh, of cognition, which are also structurally valid. Okay, and uh, uh, an important issue to um, consider is that, as I mentioned, we may have different kinds of structurally valid models. Okay, so both the uh, cognitivist uh, uh, approaches and the uh, uh, subsymbolic, the connectionist approaches. Okay can be used to model structural models of cognition, uh, provided that uh, they uh, consider the right, let's say, uh, constraint, uh, provided that they model the right constraint at both the, let's say, process level or at the uh, um, uh, more uh, neural uh, biological uh, uh, level. So for example, if you want to model the uh, complex cognitive function like natural language understanding, 
we can divide this function different kind of cognitive processes. We may have a, a phonological processing, a syntax processing, a morphology processing, lexical processing. And if you go, uh, if you are going to model the heuristics, which uh, basically rely the interrelation between these processes and the heuristic that operate within every and each process, we operate at the cognitive, uh, let's say, uh, at the cognitive level. Okay, so we will use a certain class of formalism. But if you are going to, uh, if you want to model, uh, let's say, the uh, corresponding bio, uh, biophysical plausibility of such processes, we may, may have a one-to-one -one mapping relation between every and each of these cognitive processes and the corresponding uh, neural structure. And we are going to use the uh, modeling paradigms used by the emergentist perspective. Okay, so both this kind of uh, uh, paradigms are uh, useful in order to build the cognitive artificial system having an explanatory role with respect to um, the natural system taken as a source of uh, um, inspiration. So it is not true, for example, that uh, neural models are by default always uh, uh, more plausible than uh, um, symbolic models. Okay, this is the message that I want to uh, to give you. Uh, so the first okay, take home messages of this uh, talk is that, well, cognitive artificial models have an explanatory role only if they are structurally valid models, okay? So when we talk uh, about functional models, and mo most of the ca current AI is uh, based on uh, functional uh, models, we are not talking about cognitive artificial uh, system. The second thing, as I mentioned, is that the neural models are not necessarily more plausible than hybrid or, for example, symbolic uh, models. What is really important is uh, the way in which such models are constrained are, um, based on the, the, their uh, um, modeling focus. And uh, an important aspect that I have already mentioned is that uh, the kind of models used by um, taking into account this kind of design approach can be actually used as a computational experiment and the results provided by these uh, uh, machines can be useful for refining or rethinking theoretical uh, aspects of uh, the uh, natural inspiring uh, uh, systems. So this is, this is kind of uh, uh, the, the first, uh, um, first things that I want to uh, point out. Then, as, as I mentioned, uh, I would like to provide uh, just a very um, few examples about this class of uh, system that uh, I've cherry-picked uh, from the uh, literature in the uh, AI. Um, and, uh, of course, I mean, uh, uh, it, it, would be, it would have been impossible to list all of them, but I've tried to uh, take uh, the ones that, in my opinion, uh, are best representative of uh, this kind of uh, uh, loop that is important uh, within the cognitively inspired uh, AI uh, system. So first of all, most of the, uh, when we talk about artificial, uh, cognitive artificial system, uh, an important uh, element to uh, consider is the so-called uh, time scale of human action provided by uh, Alan Newell. Uh, this is used in order to compare basically the action execution uh, task between uh, um, and, uh, the humans and the corresponding AI uh, systems. And as you can see, there are different kinds of band. There, are the, there is the biological band uh, in the bottom here, the cognitive band, the rational band, and the social band. To uh, each of these band correspond the uh, time required for the computation in both natural and artificial system. So most of the cognitively inspired AI system have been uh, um, built by using this kind uh, at this level. So by using the so-called cognitive uh, band. So where the processes were uh, somehow um, included between uh, 100 milliseconds and, uh, sen uh, and uh, 10 um, seconds. But of course, there are also other uh, uh, cognitive artificial system that have been uh, uh, executed for uh, uh, hours, for days, for weeks, and for uh, uh, 
uh, modes. Okay, so this is the less explored band, while the biological and the cognitive bands are the one which have been uh, more um, explored. So uh, first uh, uh, system that uh, I think uh, create a good connection between the let's say output in the AI literature and the corresponding let's say insights in the uh, um, cognitive literature is the general problem solver by Alan uh, um, by Alan Newell, uh, um, Herbert Simon, and uh, uh, Cliff Shaw. So this was a system uh, that was able to demonstrate simple logical uh, theorems. And uh, this system implemented uh, 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 human uh, heuristics, which is the so-called uh, um, means and analysis, means and heuristics. So according to these heuristics, what we do is that uh, um, we as a uh, human problem solver compare the current situation we, in which we are um, given a problem and the goal situation that is uh, basically when we want to arrive in order to solve uh, the, um, the problem that we have to, uh, to solve. And what we do is we apply a sort of uh, basically operators that try to reduce the space between where we are and when we want to, uh, to go. So this is a very powerful uh, and general heuristic used by humans. And this was actually implemented in uh, the general problem uh, solver. And this kind of uh, approach has led the artificial intelligence research to the study of uh, a full branch of AI, which is called uh, heuristic search. So, which is basically how to compute, for example, optimal path between a starting point and a, uh, a goal point. So this is an example of a system that was really um, important, both in the AI literature, but also that was able to say something about uh, uh, the way in which humans uh, uh, solve uh, uh, the problems by using this kind of means and uh, analysis. Uh, another well-known example that is, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, as you can see from the picture, uh, very much connected with the, the symbolic approach is the um, development of the semantic networks proposed by Ross Quillian, which was a, a PhD student by Herbert Simon. Uh, well, the idea is that uh, in this kind of networks, we, this is a kind of symbolic representation where we have a concept represented as node, a connection between this kind of uh, um, concepts. Uh, the idea of Quillian is that it was that this kind of network, uh, this kind of representational structure was a plausible model of the human uh, sem uh, semantic uh, uh, memory. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the connections, so the activation of these different uh, symbolic connections between uh, these nodes within uh, this graph structure was uh, uh, activated through a mechanism that is known as a spreading activation, which also had a very uh, strong influence in the development of uh, early connectionist systems, okay? So the spreading activation is a mechanism which is uh, very much uh, which is a very important also in connection system. So this is also another example of the impact that this kind of, this kind of cognitively inspired uh, research in building uh, artificial uh, frameworks, which um, had this kind of cognitive grounding had in the AI, um, in the AI uh, literature. Uh, again, I've taken another kind of uh, uh, model, which is the Ramalart and McClellan model of past, past, tense, uh, past tense acquisition. This is a very famous connectionist model. It is one of the most famous uh, model of the parallel distributing processing uh, uh, paradigm. This was the first model this, uh, th that showed how an emergentist approach was able to explain some feature of uh, language acquisition without any specified, predefined uh, uh, rule uh, um, grammar. In this case, uh, the training of, of the network corresponding to uh, kind of the development of the mental skills and mental capabilities, and in particular, the uh, language acquisition in, uh, um, in children. Uh, this kind of connection is the network, which is a sort of, uh, let's say, the um, uh, ancestor of the uh, current uh, a connection system uh, and uh, um, was able to explain a complex behavior such as that one of uh, language uh, um, acquisition in uh, children. Again, another important, uh, um, another, uh, important uh, 
um, worked by uh, the cognitively inspired uh, um, um, agenda in artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence research is provided by the work on cognitive architectures uh, uh, initiated by Alan uh, Newell. So this kind of architecture where uh, basically um, somehow uh, a kind of uh, uh, software instantiation that sh should have been to implement the invariant structure of uh, human, con uh, of human uh, uh, cognition. So this work led to the development of uh, SOAR, which is nowadays still one of the main cognitive architecture used in the uh, AI um, uh, literature. And it has been used in many different tasks uh, with uh, very few uh, architectural mechanisms. So architectural mechanism means that these few mechanisms, such as, for example, the chunking, okay, can be used uh, in a, a variety of tasks. So they are really cross task and they are really, um, this means that they are really able to describe uh, some uh, mechanism, uh, some underlying mechanism about uh, how uh, our mind also uh, works. So they have a, a very important, they have a very important place in the, um, in the AI uh, research and it is nowadays still a very active uh, area. Uh, I would like to conclude with a uh, um, say a more uh, modern example, which is actually a work that has been done for the last uh, uh, 10 years uh, of, uh, let's say, a novel type of uh, uh, cognitively inspired system, which is a kind of system that try to implement all these kind of uh, constraints that I have uh, um, explained uh, so far, which is called dual packs. So this is a categorization system that takes in input uh, some, uh, let's say, common sense queries and try to uh, um, basically provide as, as output the corresponding uh, uh, concept to this kind of queries. Now, these queries uh, can be seen also as a kind of riddle. So it is not just a task of retrieval, but it is really a task of uh, um, reasoning. First of all, well, this system is focused on this, uh, basically, uh, on, on this level. So. Uh, um, is a system working at the cognitive level by using the Newell time scale of uh, uh, human uh, action. And uh, uh, it is based on two main cognitive uh, um, assumptions. The first one is that we, we may have uh, in an artificial system as we have in the human, in the human cognitive structure, multiple, multiple representation of the same uh, conceptual uh, entity. And the second assumption is that on such diverse representations, uh, we uh, should execute two different types of reasoning. A system one reasoning, which is the fast, let's say, and the, uh, the fast type of reasoning according to, to the Kahneman uh, terminology, and a system two reasoning, which is the one that uh, uh, is more um, based on logic, uh, the sequential, uh, um, slow, Okay, so it's, it's not fast and, and so on and, uh, and so forth. So different representation, on, on this different representation, we have different kinds of reasoning, uh, system one reasoning and system two um, reasoning. So this is the general, uh, um, let's say, a, a possible general way to formalize that. We may have um, a concept, this concept may have a classical component, so this means uh, that uh, we may have, um, for example, necessary and sufficient conditions for uh, describing a concept within, let's say, the mind of an activity, the knowledge base of an artificial system. For example, for the concept of water, I could say that the necessary and sufficient condition is that the water is a, uh, everything that has two atoms of hydro uh, hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Okay, so this will correspond to this kind of representation. And then we have the common sense part of the, uh, of the um, representation. So for example, I can say that typically a water is uh, uh, um, liquid, uh, is uh, colorless, is uh, odorless, okay? But these are all typical features. So they, are, uh, they correspond to uh, uh, what in cognitive science is called a prototype. But we may also have some relevant exemplars of this kind of uh, uh, concept. For example, uh, the water that I have just uh, uh, drink, 
okay? It can be colored, it can be uh, red if I add something, okay? So we may have these different kinds of typicality-based representation, which are the kind of representation which activates the system one fast reasoning. And uh, then we may have a classical characterization of the same conceptual, uh, uh, conceptual entity. So what is important here, Okay, then of course, this different class of representation can be activated and go proxy in the working memory of a, a cognitive agent based on the perceptual stimulus that is retrieved. But what is important here is that these different kinds of representational structure are connected in a non ad hoc uh, way. So, um, for example, in order to represent the classical knowledge, we can use standard, uh, let's say the standard symbolic system uh, that are uh, uh, now called uh, uh, ontologies, okay? And this is what we, uh, what we did in this system. So we have uh, used uh, the psych ontology, which is uh, one of the most, uh, uh, let's say, important ontological resources uh, available with, with, modern, with more than 200 and thousand concepts and relations. While on the typicality part, we have used a different computational framework. So we have used a particular type of vector space representation, so low dimensional vector space representation. And the connection between these different kinds of representation is obtained via WordNet, okay? Which is a very well-known lexical uh, uh, database of uh, uh, English developed at uh, uh, Princeton uh, um, uh, university. Now the connection with the, so this kind of connection allowed us to have co-referring representational structure and this enabled us to pass from uh, one type of reasoning to another one within the same conceptual entity. Now how did we obtain this? I mm, will not go into the details here but uh, the point is that uh, the WordNet IDs were, um, let's say, uh, coming from free from uh, a psych that was already equipped with this kind of identifiers. While here we have integrated different kinds of linguistic resources such as BubbleNet and uh, ConceptNet in order to obtain a low level representation with uh, the uh, correspo corresponding WordNet uh, um, identifier. So uh, uh, what we did Developed was a sort of uh, integrated categorization algorithm, cognitively inspired categorization algorithm, where we integrated these two different types of categorization. Fast categorization, which basically had the task of individuating which of the typicality based representation had to um, uh, retrieve exemplar based uh, uh, representation or prototype based uh, uh, representation. And then a, a second check on the, uh, on the um, uh, basically, on the ontological classical counterpart. So this part corresponds to, let's say, the system two kinds of uh, uh, reasoning. Uh, a very different view. So basically, uh, they try to summarize what I've just said. So this system takes in input uh, sentences uh, uh, which correspond to kind of riddles, such as, for example, which, which is the big fish that eats uh, uh, plankton, okay? There is a, a standard information uh, um, extraction uh, step where we build a vector query that is uh, um, basically um, compared with the uh, vectorial knowledge base of the S1, let's say, system. The output of the S1 system is, uh, provides uh, a list of the most similar concepts with respect to our vector uh, uh, query. In this case, for example, it uh, uh, retrieves for this query the concept of whale, okay? Uh, and then what happens, this is the fast categorization, then what happens is that this first result is checked with an ontological knowledge base that says, well, look that whales, so the answer that you have provided here in a fast way, is not really appropriate because uh, whales are not fish, okay? They, are, they, are, uh, they have all the typical traits of a fish, but they are not fish, they are uh, mammals. So uh, this uh, ontological counterpart suggests another uh, knowledge. So please note that if, for example, a system like Watson would have had this kind of uh, control between uh, system one and system two reasoning system, uh, it would have uh, never done the error about Toronto, okay? Because in this case, the Toronto could have been the results coming from this first, let's say, uh, probabilistic knowledge base, but then, of course, a check on the 
uh, external symbolic uh, representation would have uh, quite easily individuated that Toronto is not uh, a US city, but it is a Canadian uh, city. So this is the way in which the system uh, work. This system has been integrated with a plethora of different cognitive architectures, okay? Uh, I've just mentioned that uh, the cognitive architecture was one of the main, let's say, uh, pillars uh, provided by the cognitive AI research in uh, um, the actual uh, um, research in artificial intelligence. Well, we have, uh, I, I didn't say that there are many kinds of cognitive architectures, okay? There are symbolic cognitive architecture, hybrid cognitive architectures, there are neural cognitive architectures because they focus at the different level of abstraction. Well, we show how this kind of hybrid knowledge base can be integrated and has been integrated in a variety of uh, different cognitive architectures and has extended their uh, reasoning uh, capability on the, this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, task. I have a, a demo that I can uh, show you. For example, if we consider uh, a query like uh, a big fish, which is the a big fish with very sharp teeth, right? So we can, uh, um, we run basically this uh, query on our system. As I mentioned, there is a very shallow information extraction step uh, that uh, allows us to basically individuate which are the main elements that we have to consider in order to form the vector uh, query. Then uh, this, uh, um, this uh, uh, vector query uh, uh, is transformed in the, uh, let's say, um, language of uh, one of the cognitive architectures to which this system is uh, integrated. And for example, um, what you can see here is that the first uh, answer that is retrieved is shark, okay? Um, this may be, uh, this is the fast, okay? The fast uh, uh, categorization that is provided. And then what happens is that here uh, you can see um, the system is loading the ontology in order to see whether the um, answer provided by the first uh, S1 categorization system is okay or, uh, or not. And uh, uh, well, in this case, uh, um, the, the class shark, you can see here in the bottom, uh, results uh, uh, to be uh, consistent, okay? You can see that there is written consistent here. So in this case, we do not have the problem that we encountered for the whale example. So this is just an example of uh, this kind of system. The system is available uh, um, online. It can be uh, downloaded, of course. Uh, we have evaluated this system with uh, uh, gold standard. So with uh, the uh, answers that, uh, um, uh, with human answer, provided for uh, the kind of riddles that I've showed you uh, before. So this is an example, uh, for, for example, uh, uh, which is the primate with red nose. This is the, uh, the uh, main uh, um, um, responses provided by the humans for monkey or, or mandrill and so on and so forth. <clears throat> what we had was a pretty high accuracy if we consider this task, okay? This task is a, a one of the difficult tasks for, uh, let's say, um, AI uh, systems. But we had, uh, uh, let's say, a, a pretty high level of concept categorization accuracy comparing our results with the gold standards, with the, the results provided by the uh, humans. And this is something that uh, you can see here. So our comparison goes from the 70% 70, uh, 70 to 89%, which is a pretty high accuracy uh, level for this kind of, uh, uh, of task. But uh, I showed you this kind of system, not only to tell you, okay, this system is able to do better than other AI system in this task, but also because by using this kind of simulation, we were able to provide a sort of reverse inference to the kind of theories, let's say, that we have implemented in this kind of, um, in this kind of system. For example, uh, we showed how, um, and this is in contrast with uh, what was assumed by the uh, cognitive psychology. So uh, we showed how it is not true that uh, the exemplars, uh, so the, the exemplar-based representation, if are similar enough to the stimulus that is taken 
uh, in input to the system are always preferred with respect to the prototypes because basically we implemented this kind of heuristic that came from the um, uh, literature in quantum psychology. <coughs> But uh, then we analyzed the errors of our system, and most of our errors, okay, were due to this kind of, uh, let's say, wrong assumption. So uh, this is something that we, uh, uh, enable us to tell to the psychologists, look, that there is something that you have to revise in your theory, because we use this kind of simulation, and it seems that uh, uh, the results are, non, um, are not uh, su um, supporting your original uh, theory. So, um, this, I showed you this uh, system in which I worked in for uh, pointing out both these, let's say, results in the AI literature and in the cognitive, uh, um, cognitive modeling uh, uh, literature. So, as a snapshot, really, for uh, concluding the talk, I've tried to uh, show you that uh, cognitive inspired systems have played and play an important role in AI research. Uh, in general, uh, let's say, uh, what simple task, uh, tasks which are uh, results to be very simple for humans are the most complicated ones for AI system. And this is where uh, the AI paradigm can still play a very important role in, uh, for building intelligent uh, systems. And I have uh, listed here just a few uh, of the modern areas in which uh, this kind of approach can be actually taken into account, such as, for example, few of our one-shot learning, common sense reasoning, transverse learning, computational creativity, narrative understanding, heuristic integration of planning, action, and goal-oriented reasoning, computational model of emotion, analogy, cognitive and social robotics, explainable AI, and many others. So these are these are all all these areas correspond to a class of problems that you are, or end of tasks that you are able to, uh, let's say, deal with uh, quite in a natural way as humans, and that uh, um, artificial systems are not able to uh, really deal with. Uh, I will conclude with a sort of a, a advertisement. Uh, so, uh, so um, some of the things that I have uh, uh, introduced here are in this uh, forthcoming book, uh, book uh, from uh, uh, Taylor and Francis in 2021. This, of course, was just a very brief, let's say, uh, overview. In the book, you will find uh, more uh, uh, details and uh, information and more uh, examples. So uh, thank you very much. If you have questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lieto. It's a very useful and informative uh, lecture for us. And this lecture uh, was organized by uh, Kiev Mohila uh, University and Dean of Economic Faculty, uh, Alexandra Humina. Thank you, and if you have some questions, uh, please ask. Uh, Mike, I want to ask, uh, if you please. Oleg Solvyov. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for your report, interesting report. Uh, uh, dear Dr. Lieto. And uh, in my question, uh, I'll uh, be a little bit far from your um, report, but uh, uh, as it seems to me, I, I'll be in some, uh, in, uh, in, fr in the framework of your competence. As, as it seems to me. Uh, so, I believe that uh, intellectual processes, the processes of, uh, of operating information in, uh, in high developed uh, human-like and uh, human syst uh, systems must be, first, in some way causally independent from um, uh, physical reality environment and second have some indeterministic character because of the factor of subjectivity because of the factor of subjectivity uh, such features of such processes are as it seems to me well um, demonstrated 
in the phenomena of, for example, spontaneity, uh, minimization of free energy, as in Carl Freestone's, uh, Freestone's theory, in uh, non-equilibrium steady states, uh, stable states, and so and so and others. But strong science, strong science, uh, is exactly mathematically equipped, uh, equipped science. Uh, so my question is, as for you, has modern mathematics, modern mathematics, the mathematical, rather strong mathematical tools to describe such high level, uh, complicated, chaotic, uh, principally non-algorithmic, non uh, even semiotically active processes? Um, so it's my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for um, for your questions. Uh, so um, I think that uh, if I at once were in a very let's say straightforward way, straightforward way, I would say no, that's in the sense that uh, we do not still have a, a, a really a, a mathematical tool in order that enable us to describe this kind of high level quantity functions. For example the dynamical systems equation that you were mentioning uh, are used and, uh, and very much used at the low level. So in order to, uh, for example, control uh, uh, robots and this kind uh, of elements which are very uh, strongly, let's say, uh, kind of uh, uh, dependent from the physical reality, but we still do not have this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, mathematical tool to describe uh, a higher level of uh, uh, cognitive uh, uh, functions, but this is something that, uh, of course, uh, is an open research. Uh, uh, is an open uh, research uh, issues. There are many people that are trying to uh, um, deal with this kind of uh, uh, of gap, but of course, it's very it's very uh, complicated uh, um, one. And I agree that there is. This, uh, I mean, um, the kind of disting uh, distinction that you were made can be, can be somehow aligned to uh, the kind of distinction that I was doing between, let's say, kind of intellectual, say, system two kinds of processes, high level quantity processes, and uh, let's say, more uh, low level uh, quantity processes. I think that uh, for up to now, we have a fairly, uh, let's say, um, useful mathematical models for the low level part, but not for the uh, uh, high level part. That's, for example, if you are talking about dynamical differential equation, but uh, that's why we use other formalism, okay? In order to, uh, to um, model this kind of higher level, uh, higher level uh, functions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, some questions, some practical question uh, about uh, practical possibility to uh, establish this system. Uh, could this flexible um, approach, uh, cognitive approach, uh, be useful for um, uh, some application, some IT application, computer application uh, that operate in social systems? in uh, economics uh, could be uh, useful this approach for um, modern uh, practical systems? Yeah, uh, I think so. Uh, as I was trying to, uh, mm, uh, to show you, and I'll try to uh, go back, let's see if I'm able. As I was trying to show you um, by taking into account the dual time scale of human action, mm -hmm. most of the uh, work was focused on this yeah. level, okay, or also on the rational level. But of course, if we go to the social level, we need to have models about the theory of mind of other agents, for example, in order to have coordination between a multi-agent hybrid uh, society that can be composed by both humans and artificial uh, and artificial uh, uh, systems. And there is a lot of work that is currently being uh, done, uh, let's say, on the social uh, uh, level, uh, to model the social level behavior in cognitive system and in cognitive uh, artificial, uh, um, cognitive artificial system. So uh, I'm not doing that kind of work, but uh, in the literature, there, are, there, is, there is a lot of work that uh, 
explain how this kind of approach can be really helpful in order to build, uh, let's say, a system that are able to exhibit this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, social level intelligence that we as humans uh, also uh, are able to exhibit. This also involves, for example, modeling emotions. Emotions are, uh, let's say, a driving uh, uh, matter for uh, human decision, uh, human decision making. Also, in economic, uh, uh, in the economic um, environment. Okay, so yes, there is a lot of work, and for sure, this kind of paradigm is uh, um, is useful in that in that respect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Dear colleagues, another question? If you please, one more question. Okay. Um, Dr. Iglieta, I don't have uh, in your report uh, from you um, uh, any word about uh, uh, such uh, characteristic of uh, um, human, uh, exactly human, uh, system of operation and information. I mean subjective value, subjective value. Uh, but as for me, subjective value is an operator of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, information in neuronal networks of, of, of the human brain. Um, and uh, I, I am very interested uh, for this question. Yeah, uh, thank you. I didn't mention this aspect, which is a very important one, because uh, uh, the goal of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, of the kind of system that I have uh, showed you is not really that one of trying to uh, individuate and to model individual differences, let's say, which are also, of course, uh, uh, which are also um, always possible in the, the dynamic of a given intelligent uh, behavior. But the goal was that one of trying to uh, uh, find out which are, which are the common, okay, uh, the common architectural elements that can drive to the development of individual differences in the, um, in the behavior about, for example, decision making and this kind of stuff. But of course, let's say subjective values are important and is something that uh, um, uh, can be modeled in this kind of uh, uh, in this kind of system i would say that uh, my focus was uh, mainly um, uh, driven to point out what are the common elements the architectural elements but one that mm -hmm. once that you have uh, established this kind of uh, architectural uh, elements you can then build also let's say uh, single models that are able to, uh, for example, show this kind of individual differences within that common kind of uh, uh, architecture. So, there, but there is for sure this double, uh, uh, double uh, modeling, uh, double modeling level. And in the cognitive uh, AI community, they are both modeled. My talk was mainly focused on the, let's say, kind of architectural constraints, which can be Use, but thank you for the question. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question, can I? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I am doing research in this area as well from the standpoint of cognitive linguistics and cognitive psychology. And um, you mentioned uh, closer to the end of your presentation that there is a need for a more fine-grained theory explaining in greater detail the interactions between uh, the coexisting representations, right? And do yes. you see any developments of this kind of fine-grained theory or are you developing it yourself? Uh, I'd be interesting to, to learn that, yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, these, uh, uh, let's see, this comment was made uh, uh, mainly about uh, uh, the, um, the dual pack systems that uh, I have uh, developed. So what came out from this kind of simulation was that actually some of the heuristics that we took from the cognitive psychologies uh, in order to build this kind of intelligent system were actually one of our main source of errors when we compared 
our results with the answers provided by students. So uh, what we have been able to do is to uh, provide by using this kind of uh, uh, simulation a way to say uh, to the experimental psychologists that there is something wrong in the way in which they have uh, uh, basically hypothesized this kind of uh, heuristic interconnection between the different kinds of uh, uh, representations to be um, retrieved in this kind of uh, task. So um, uh, we are also going to uh, provide, uh, but we are not there yet, okay? We're also going to provide, uh, uh, let's say, a kind of extension of this kind of uh, uh, simulation that should be able to include also another class of typicality-based uh, uh, representations. Uh, and we are going to try to uh, <coughs> use this model in order to see whether and to what, to what extent this kind of, let's say, computational addition that we are doing can be used in order to fill the gap that we have between the, the, what comes from the um, uh, theory uh, coming from the experimental psychology and what we uh, found out uh, in, in, our, in our, let's say, computational experiment. I think that this is a, a very important issue in cognitive modeling. So to uh, use the models uh, uh, the computational models that you have in order to test as if theories. So counterfactual, sort of counterfactual theories, right? So we, we do not know whether this kind of addition is, uh, let's say, cognitively inspired because the theory ends basically uh, from coming from the psychological literature, but we are trying to uh, see whether this kind of addition can actually improve our um, uh, results and can be used as a possible, let's say, explanatory element to integrate within the psychological uh, um, theory. Thank you. But this is, I uh, should know that this is a very interesting uh, feedback loop that you have here between uh, computational models and then going back to the uh, biological or cognitive models. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Dear colleagues, uh, more question? So, uh, dear colleagues, you can uh, connect with uh, Dr. Lieto from uh, their uh, site, antonioleta.net. Nice to see you today. Nice to hear you today. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Yes. Thank you very much for the, uh -huh. thank you uh, for the invitation. Thank you. I would like to say words of uh, gratitude to Dr. Lieta for interesting lecture. And I hope we will see you very soon in Kiev. I, 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 I hope I will be able to, to come. I mean, let's see how this uh, virus crisis uh, goes. Yeah. Could I thank everybody? I'm an interloper from the UK and I wouldn't have been able to participate in this book but for the fact it was remote. So I wanted to thank everybody. Yeah, and good luck with your forthcoming book. It's going to yeah. be an interesting read. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, it was really a pleasure for me to give this presentation. Let's hope, let's hope the next time uh, it will be in Kiev. So. Yeah. Okay, I hope. Are you afraid of our coronavirus? Mm -hmm. What? Are you afraid of our coronavirus? No, no, I'm afraid of our coronavirus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you for you. Yeah. Hope for next meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you.